Many applications nowadays uh, use machine learning to solve some of their problems. For example, if we have a look at a standard modern smartphone, uh, it will going to have some kind of personal assistant that is capable of voice recognition, uh, understanding human language to some extent. We will have a keyboard that you don't have to tap on separate symbols. You can just make a gesture and it's going to know what word you meant. Um, also, web search, that uses machine learning to some extent as well. So there is no doubt that machine learning is an important discipline in modern computer science. That's why today we're going to talk a bit about the basics of that field, um, see some example algorithms, how we can use them, how they work, how we can evaluate them. So first, let's answer a question. What is machine learning? Uh, Wikipedia defines it as a scientific discipline that explores the construction and study of algorithms that can learn from data. Well, that explains everything. Thank you. Any questions? Seriously, though, the uh, main point of machine learning is that instead of just following explicitly, explicit instruction, instructions given by the programmer, we also use a model, pre-built model, uh, defined from input data uh, to make our decisions and predictions. There are two main classes of uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, supervised and unsupervised. And as with many things in that field, there is also a third class, which is a hybrid of the remaining two, called semi-supervised uh, learning. Let's have a look at how they differ, what characterizes them. So first of all, supervised learning is what we usually think of when we say machine learning. Uh, it tries to solve a problem of finding an, an output given some input data. And that subdivides further into two ca categories. Regression, uh, where we have to give an output that, it, that lies on some uh, continuous spectrum. For example, how much would an apartment cost if it's placed here and has that many bedrooms and is that big. Um, on the other hand, we have classification algorithms that have some predefined finite set of labels, and we have to pick one of them for each of the data points. For example, does that picture uh, show a face of a person? Or is that person a human? Or maybe an alien lizard sent down to Earth to destroy humanity as we know it. Second big class of machine learning algorithms is unsupervised learning algorithms, where we don't have the outputs provided. We just try to find an overall structure in the data that we have. Examples of unsupervised learning problems would be clustering or blind signal separation. Uh, we're not going to talk about that today, because those actually will, were both covered in previous talks. Um, also briefly on semi-supervised learning before we move on, is the hybrid of the previous two, like I mentioned. So it uses uh, some of the unsupervised learning uh, approaches to solve supervised learning problems. For example, if we want to do some clustering of big chunk of data, but we only have uh, the class, the, classification of a big chunk of data, but we only have the classes for some of the inputs, then we can perform clustering without actually using the labels, then use the labels to find uh, correct outputs for all the data points, and then run uh, a supervised learning algorithm on that. That helps us because we have more data so we can get more accurate result, uh, and also we can use that information that we had, but we couldn't have used without using our unsupervised learning techniques. So there are some ideas that are common between all or most of the uh, algorithms in supervised learning, which we're going to focus on today. So let's introduce some definitions and notation at the same time. So the first problem we face is how do we actually represent the problem in terms of a machine learning problem? Uh, we need some training data, some input data, uh, for every point. I use the example of apartment, so let's have that. Uh, we can have some features. For example, its area, 
number of bedrooms, longitude and latitude, why not? Whatever we can think of. And then on the other side, we have some corresponding outputs, la labels. Uh, in this case, how much the, the apartment would cost. So on the left, you can see a graph of, a, uh, of an example of a regression problem. We have the inputs on the horizontal axis and the output on the vertical axis. So we can see that the points follow some kind of line, straight line. So the idea is that they, the data we have would follow some underlying function that we don't actually know. But we have the points, which are at the same time noisy, and from those we have to find that underlying function. On the right hand side, we have an example of a classification problem, uh, where we have some set of 2D points. Uh, some of them are red circles, some of them are blue crosses. If I put another point in there, should it be a red circle or a blue uh, cross? We need to find some boundary saying where uh, which class uh, lines lies on that plane. A solution to a machine le learning problem is a hypothesis. A hypothesis is going to be a function that assigns outputs to our given input data. For example, on the left, we can see uh, that it's a straight line that goes more or less through all the points. So if we had a new point that we haven't seen before, we just plug in the input data, we read the value of the function at that point, and we have our output. Uh, in case of classification problem, uh, we are more interested in the boundary. There is only a straight line on the graph, but in fact it would probably be some kind of warped uh, 3D plane. Uh, but the most interesting part is a boundary. Where, where does the limit between one class and the other line lie? And hypothesis is parametrized by theta, which is a vector. It's a set of parameters for a given feature vector. So if we have features, each of them is gonna have its own parameter that we multiply it by, and that gives us the hypothesis. We may also plug it into some function. So then, out of this family of hypotheses, we need to pick the best one. In order to be able to do that, we need to define what the best is. So we're gonna use a cost function, which given the set of parameters theta, the parameter vector, uh, is gonna tell us, looking at the input data, the training data, it's gonna tell us how good or bad our hypothesis is, how well it fits the data. Uh, in many, ca many cases, training is nothing more than just minimizing the value of, of the cost function j depending on theta. Obviously, the hypothesis and the cost function depend on the actual algorithm, so I can't give any actual examples right now. We're gonna talk about them later. But now, if we want to minimize a function, how do we do that? In many cases, we can, well, not, maybe not many, but in some cases, we can try to do that analytically. But in most cases, we would prefer a numerical solution, like gradient descent. Uh, last week, there was a talk on local search. Uh, gradient descent is basically the same problem, the same algorithm, except we don't have a discrete search space. We actually have a continuous search space. So we can't just jump to the next state. We have to take, we, we can take a step in any direction of any length. So how do we solve that? Well, we start with some random theta, just like we started with a random state. Then from that point, we pick a direction in which the, in, in which, in which, which the cost function decreases the fastest. Uh, we can do that by just calculating the derivative. Then we make a step in that direction. It's a step of size alpha, if you can see that parameter in that maths. Um, we take a step of size alpha, and then we continue stepping like that until no progress is made, or very little progress is made through a few iterations. There are two big problems with this. First of all, if we have more than one minimum, then we're not guaranteed to find the, the global one, which is a big problem because we want that one. Uh, 
but then again, in machine learning, we're usually going to be using squared, uh, squared sum, sum of squared errors as the cost function, which has a single minimum. So that problem doesn't really apply. The second biggest problem is picking the right value for alpha, for alpha because it's going to be different for every problem. If we make it too big, then we're going to step too far. We may overshoot the minimum or even start oscillating around it and never actually reaching it. If we make it too small, training is going to take a long, long time, and we don't want that either. Unfortunately, the only solution really to that problem is just trial and error. There's no better way we can do it. OK, so let's talk about some actual algorithms. We'll start with regression. Just a reminder, it's where we have to pick a number on the continuous spectrum, like cost of the apartment. Uh, and the first example, simplest one, most of you probably seen that in physics practicals, is linear regression. We try to fit a straight line into our data so that the hypothesis is simply pairwise multiplication of uh, of parameters and features, parameters theta, features x, then we sum them up and we have the value of our hypothesis. That's going to give us a straight line. Usually, we use a small trick here. Uh, we add another feature, x0, which is always equal to 1, no matter what, and that allows us to write this hypothesis as a dot product of theta and x, like this. This has two advantages. First of all, the notation is more concise. Second of all, if you use an actual linear algebra library, it may exploit characteristics of your software, of your hardware, and make it faster than just a simple for loop. So we have a hypothesis like that, a straight line. We also need a cost function. Like I mentioned before, we're usually going to be using sum of squared errors. So we just calculate value of the hypothesis for each data point that we have. We find the difference of our prediction with the actual label, square that, sum for all the data points that we have, and that's going to be our cost function. Obviously, we want th this to be as small as possible, so we run gradient descent. We get some values theta that give the smallest value of j, and we're golden. We're done. This has a few advantages. Well, first of all, it's very simple. In C or C++, you can close it up in like 20 lines of code if you use a linear algebra uh, library. In MATLAB, we probably will sque squeeze that in, into five. Um, and the big advantage of the cost function, really, not the algorithm uh, altogether, is that the cost function has only one minimum, so we can reliably use a gradient descent. We don't have to worry that we're going to get stuck in a local minimum because the only local minimum we have is the global minimum. There is one huge disadvantage, though, and it is that the data has to follow a straight line. Um, if you actually did physics practicals, you probably realized how much effort they put into making that one uh, condition true, all this fiddling with formulas so that all the data you collected would follow a straight line in the end. However, we don't have to do that we may just try to extend, that, uh, extend the linear regression algorithm to be able to produce more complex uh, hypotheses. Simplest way to do that would be to extend our uh, feature vectors to include some higher degree coefficients in it. So let's say we have feature vectors that includes width and length of something, and obviously we have the feature that's always equal to one at the top. So let's use square of, the, square of the width, square of the length, and product of the two. So we get new feature vector like this. We can simply calculate it for all the data that we have, because it's just multiplication. And then we run linear algorithm on those new extended feature vectors, and that's it. What does it actually give us? Well, if, you, if we run linear regression on, on the original feature vector, we would get a hypothesis of the form that you can see on the slide, which is very, uh, very restricted. But if we run it on those extended feature vectors, we're going to get a more complicated, uh, more complex curve, less restricted one. Actually, this can represent any second degree curve. And we don't have to stop there. We can add even more degrees 
we can even add another function like a logarithm, it's not gonna be polynomial regression per se, but who stops us? We can still do it. The big advantage of that is that we can fit arbitrarily complex hypotheses into our data. Like, nothing stops us. Like, we can literally fit anything as long as we extend the feature vector properly. And the cost function still has a single minimum. We didn't change it. In fact, it's still linear regression that we're running on that, so we don't have to actually write any new machine learning code. It's just the feature vectors that we have to extend. On the other hand, as we introduce more and more degrees to that feature vector, we're gonna get a big, big, big number of features. Um, so, for example, if you have a thousand features, we try to include all the second degree uh, factors, we're gonna get about a million of them. So, that's not good. Uh, but usually, we would only limit ourselves to using like actually the second, uh, second degrees, like actually second powers, like not, not even products, just second and third powers. So that means if we had a thousand features, we're gonna have two or three thousand. That's not best, but still better than having a million of them. Okay, so now let's talk about classification. Uh, just a reminder, classification is when we have some predefined finite set of labels and we have to assign one of them to each of the inputs. So the most, the simplest approach, and this is actually mentioned at Tripos a few times, is the naive, is the naive Bayesian classifier, which asks the question, what's the probability that the given label is the right one for our feature vector, for our input data? And then give an answer to that question, we just pick the one that has the highest probability, and then that's it. We have the right, the right class, the right label for, for our data. However, the tricky, tricky part is, how do we actually calculate that probability? Because probability P of L given X is, what's the probability that the label L is right for X? Well, that's not straightforward to calculate at all. So we can use Bayes' theorem to invert that probability, and now we have to calculate the three probabilities. First of all, what's the probability that a, a feature vector with label L is gonna be similar to X? Then the probability uh, that any feature vector has the label L, and probability that any feature vector is of form X. Well, P of L is quite easy to calculate, we just we just count how many of the points we have have that label, we divide it by the number of all the points, there's our probability. But how do we calculate the remaining two? Well, that's where the naive part comes in, because we add another assumption that all the features that we have are independent. So that the probabilities that were difficult to calculate beforehand now are just products of some number of very simple probabilities. For example, probability that a feature vector has a feature xi at place i, we just count how many are there in the training data, and we're done. So we know how to calculate that. Um, so we calculate it, and then on the, in the actual algorithm, we just, do the pro we just do the products, we just calculate those. Advantages of that of, of this algorithm of this algorithm is that there is literally no optimization to perform. In in regression, we had to do the gradient descent thing. We needed a cost function. Here, we don't even have a cost function. We just calculate the probabilities and we're done. Um, it is very simple, but on the other hand, it is very useful. Many of natural language processing problems can be solved just with naive Bayesian classifiers. We don't need anything else. We can use something else to get better results, but we can solve them using this one anyway. But then there are the two huge disadvantages. First of all, the assumption that the features are independent is a very big assumption. They are usually not. We may drop that assumption, but then calculations are difficult. We may keep it, even though the features are not independent, and get a worse approximation, trade-off. Then also, it requires the feature values to be some 
to be in some discrete domain. I can't, for example, have a feature saying uh, how tall a person is, uh, because how do I calculate probability for that? I have to either quantize it somehow, put it in some bins, like from 180 to 185, or I can try to calculate probabilities in a continuous distribution, but that's more difficult than just counting. So we can use another approach, logistic regression, that actually doesn't make any of those two assumptions. Uh, it's called log logistic regression because the main step is actually doing regression. We try to fit a logistic curve into our data, and the logistic curve is defined by the formula you can see on the slide. And for those of you who cannot uh, automatically see that in your head, you have a plot below. So the nice thing about this curve is that it's always between zero and one, and for most part, it's close to either one of them. It's only in the middle part, we get something in, in between, but we have this nice midpoint at zero where the value of the logistic function is exactly a half. So we can fit that curve, well, not exactly curve, it's gonna be some n-dimensional hyperplane that is bent in the middle. We can fit that into our data and just say that whatever has a value below a half has that label, and whatever has a value below, below 0.5 doesn't have that label. So that means we need a separate hypothesis for each of the labels that we have. So we find a separate uh, parameter vector theta uh, for each of the labels L by calculating the dot product of feature vector and parameter vector. We plug that into sigma because dot product is a number. Then we get a number back, that's our hypo hypothesis. And each of those will independently, independently decide whether the label it was trained for is correct for the given feature vector. So we run a few hypotheses for that data, and the one that has the highest value of hypothesis, hypothesis is gonna be the right one. Okay. So advantages of that. It's still mostly just a simple regression. Just some rounding stuff at the top to make it a, classi a classification algorithm. In the form that I presented it, it only produces boundaries that are straight lines, but we can use the same trick we used with linear regression, just extend the feature vector to make it handle more complex boundaries. A disadvantage of that, of that approach, is that we require multiple classifiers. However, that's not a disadvantage of this algorithm itself, Ver almost all of the non-neural network classification algorithms require more than one classifier to handle multi-class classific classification. However, if we only have two classes, uh, two, label, two different labels to assign, then we actually only need one hypothesis, one classifier. Okay, uh, now we picked an algorithm we want to implement, uh, we want to implement the program. What do we do? Where, well, first step would be to prototype it, probably in something like MATLAB or Octave, which is basically the same language, just free to use. It has a lot of features that allow you to do machine learning out of the box. Uh, linear regression, it has like a separate function for that. You can do polynomial fitting. Um, it has a function to predict from a model. So if you, you can train a model manually and then just use predict. Um, the most important, though, would be out of those, uh, the fit NLM, which fits a non-linear regression. Basically, you give it a, uh, a cost function, Im implementation of a cost function, implementation of a hypothesis function, and it just trains the data. So it can, you can have uh, basically any regression algorithm uh, implemented using this. But then MATLAB is really slow, and it's a pain to use it. So you're gonna have to switch to C and C++ uh, to write the actual program. Um, and there are a lot of libraries for, for those languages that you can use. Uh, there is the very general one, like Dlib, uh, which also does a lot of other stuff, image processing, um, 
digital signal processing, all kinds of different stuff. Uh, and you have the more specialized libraries like libsvm and liblinear, which uh, implement more sophisticated algorithms that we actually didn't talk about today. Uh, but if you're interested, by, interested in that, um, it's definitely a good thing to check them out. If you want to use any other language, uh, then I'm sorry, but you should probably use one of those two. Because, yeah, they're either slower than C++ uh, or, or have less features than MATLAB, so it's like two, spec two ends of the same spectrum. Now, we implemented it. Now we have to know how good it actually is. So we have to evaluate it. Uh, the important thing about machine learning algorithms is that it ha they have to run on previously unseen data. So uh, I train on some of the data, and then it has to perform on the data that was not in the training uh, set, because, well, it's difficult to collect all the possible data in the world. Uh, and even if you manage that, training on that would take forever. Also, it would be redundant because you could just have a lookup table. Uh, so if you have some training data, you take a subset of it, a half or two thirds, you run your training on that, uh, and then you use the rest to measure how well the algorithm performs on unseen data. Uh, but how do we measure that? Well, th that depends on the algorithm, that depends on the problem. Uh, there are a few measure measurements that you can, that you can use. Uh, the most common one would be accuracy, def especially in classification problems. What percentage of the time does your algorithm get the right answer? Uh, then you have stuff like false negatives and positives. That would be useful, for example, for phase detection. Uh, false negative is when there is a face in the picture, but your algorithm didn't find it. And the false positive is if there isn't a face in the picture, but your algorithm finds it. Coverage, also useful, for example, for phase detection. For example, if your algorithm says that my face is somewhere here, well, then it's wrong, and the previous uh, measurements w won't find it, uh, the previous metrics. So we use coverage to see how much of the area of faces is actually covered by your detections, and the higher it is, the better. And then mean absolute error, which is more uh, relevant for uh, regression problems, is we see how far away you're from the real answer on average. I mean absolute error. It's average error. Never mind. Okay, so we implemented the algorithm. We implemented the algorithm. Uh, it works. It gets 99.9% .9 accuracy. Time to celebrate. Well, no. Probably your algorithm exhibits something called overfitting because it's very improbable that you're going to get 99.9% .9 accuracy. Uh, what is overfitting? Well, let's say we have this data, and we try to fit a line in it, into it, some curve. Well, obviously, that should be a straight line. Uh, that goes kind of, yeah, increasing straight line. But let's say we try fit a 20th degree polynomial into it. So we get something like this. That looks wrong. And it is very wrong because it learns some of the noise. And even though noise is usually random, so it shouldn't matter that much, your data set may be biased and have, uh, and have some skewed noise. So it's going to learn the noise specific for the data set that you have. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the same way in any other data that you use. So we're going to have a, so it's going to generalize very poorly. And you may get something like 50% of previously unseen data on previously unseen data, which is basically like a coin toss. One way to solve that problem would be to just limit the number of degrees of freedom. But what if, what if we actually want to fit a 20th degree polynomial into the data? Well, we can use something called regularization. Yay, Macarena. So this solve, solves to some extent the problem of, of overfitting. Without, without limiting the complexity. What we do is we extend the cost function uh, to penalize high values of coefficients. So that, would mean, that will mean that uh, the coefficients will tend to be close to zero, unless them being higher is actually needed to fit the data. Uh, 
uh, so if they actually contribute to, this, to the uh, correct shape of the, of the curve. Now, behind this math, there is a coefficient that I sneaked in, a zeta, before the second big sigma, which is another coefficient that we have to find by trial and error. Uh, this is the rate at we, on which we want to penalize uh, the algorithm for picking big coefficients. And if we pick it too large, then all the coefficients are going to be zero because it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be a good idea. It's not going to be going to be penalized very harshly for trying to fit the data. So it's just going to give up and set everything to zero. If we make it too small, well, then we basically have have uh, a machine learning algorithm that uses no regularization at all. So this is again something that you have to find by trial and error. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much.